In yet another embarrassing leak, much like the so-called Panama Papers, the financial world has been rocked once more, this time under allegations that London is the global financial capital when it comes to money laundering and corruption, with leaked papers showing that various UK-based banks have been filtering dirty money through its vaults at a shocking rate. The files, which have been called the FinCEN files, have seen links made to various international banks from around the world. But rather worryingly, it seems, this is old news, with Deutsche Bank, for example, stating that they were aware of suspicious activity and had taken steps to combat money laundering. Wir nehmen den Kampf gegen Geldwäsche und natürlich auch gegen Kapitalflucht sehr, sehr ernst. Wir arbeiten eng mit den Strafermittlungsbehörden zusammen, wie das andere Banken auch tun. Das, was jetzt berichtet wird, ist nicht neu, nicht für uns, auch nicht für unsere Aufsichtsbehörden. Es ist alles aufgearbeitet. Wir haben, das, haben uns das alles sehr, sehr genau angeguckt. Vor allem aber haben wir auch sehr stark in diesen Bereich seit 2015 investiert. Damals hatten wir 500 Mitarbeiter im Anti-Geldwäsche-Bereich. Heute haben wir dort über 1500 Mitarbeiter und wir bauen weiterhin auf. So what exactly are the FinCEN files? The exposure of the files came about following the investigation by the BuzzFeed News International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, or the ICIJ, and shows over 200,000 suspicious financial transactions valued at over 2 trillion US dollars. This explanation came straight from the team responsible at BuzzFeed. We've obtained for the first time internal US Treasury documents that have been created by banks and shared with the U.S. government. In them, you find that banks are tracking money launderers, terrorism financiers, narco traffickers, numerous accounts all over the world. Welcome to Economic Divide with me, Omid Roshandal. I'm standing in for Kavit Hagwai as he covers the U.S. election on our new sister show, Decision 2020. In this week's episode, we take a look at the corruption and money laundering happening right in front of the eyes of the world's largest banks. And it seems that many of them know what's happening, but are failing to act. Remember, we want to hear your thoughts on this or any other topic. So make sure you check our Twitter page by visiting us using the mark here, ed underscore program. Drop us a message there, and we promise to share your stories and get back to all our viewers. With London being one of the major hubs of money laundering in the world, some of the banks involved just go to show how extensive the scandal was. With big names such as JP Morgan, HSBC, Standard Chartered, Deutsche Bank, and Barclays all having been named. Now, according to the ICIJ, some 62% of the leaked files have a direct link to Deutsche Bank, with at least 20% involving addresses and businesses located in the tax haven of the British Virgin Islands. Some of the prominent names involved include Donald Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and Russian crime boss, Semyon. Miguelevich. The money alone involved on the Deutsche Bank side of the scandal is truly eye-catching. With around $1.3 trillion worth of suspicious transactions being filtered through the system, whereas much of this received millions of dollars of fines for breaching U.S. sanctions, it was a still a major source of money laundering for drug traffickers, organized crime syndicates, and of course terrorism funding through the so-called crime terror nexus. <music> September saw the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, or the ICIJ, release a set of findings which have been labelled as the FinCEN files. Along with the BuzzFeed news outlet, over 400 reporters dig deep into the heart of the global banking financial system and expose a shocking truth of widespread money laundering. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists put together a team of more than 400 reporters from around the world. Alongside these journalists, ICIJ has led and reported on this project for over a year. And what the FinCEN files reveal is the role of global banks in industrial-scale money laundering. The files, which saw some $2 trillion of dirty money exposed, appears to be only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what could be trillions more, as the ICIJ stated that they only had access to a certain number of files found in the US. Some of the names involved in the scandal are rock-solid financial banking companies with the likes of Deutsche Bank, Barclays and HSBC all involved, as well as Standard Chartered, JP Morgan and more. The worrying factor is, however, the reality that dirty money is not a victimless crime, with the money coming from a host of illegal activities, from human trafficking, drug money 
and terrorism, leaving behind a very dark trail of vulnerable victims in the process, feeding trillions of dollars into the underworld right in front of the noses of the world's most trusted banks, who appear to be blanking the act. This project is about mapping the vast oceans of dirty money that are coursing through the world's economy and about the failure or quite possibly refusal on the parts of banks and governments to stop it. And it's also about showing the human misery that that economy funds and why stopping it matters. It seems, however, that like many guilty parties around the corporate world, banks were quick to retaliate against the accusations, stating that they were all fighting to improve the system and that the notion of dirty money coming through their doors was something they did not want. So what has been revealed in the files? Starting in the UK, the reason that London has been declared the hub of financial money laundering is due to the findings of the files, which suggest that over 3,000 UK companies are named in the FinCEN files. This is more than any other country in the documents. Whereas many of the transactions are linked to organized crime and drug trafficking, the issue of funding terrorism has also arisen, with the Standard Chartered Bank having moved money for the Arab Bank in the region of 166 billion US dollars. This is happening more than a decade after the Jordanian Arab Bank had been used in funding terrorism. In another big money move, the US bank JP Morgan allowed a shadowy company to move around 1 billion US dollars through its system, even after it learned that much of the money was stolen cash that had been illegally obtained via scams and uncovered by the FBI. One of the most interesting aspects that's emerged from the FinCEN files is the scale of people involved in the scandal. As expected, the majority of money transfers appear to be from the crime-related syndicates and gangs. However, it seems that the British establishment has also come under fire in the revelations, with indications suggesting that the current British government is highly involved in the affair. One such case saw the husband of one of the Conservative Party's largest donors secretly funding the group via money provided by a Russian oligarch with close ties to Vladimir Putin. It appears that Lubov Chernikin donated around £1.7 million to the Tories, allowing her to spend time with the last three Prime Ministers, including dinners with Theresa May and tennis sessions with Boris Johnson. Leaked files show that Chernikin's husband received a sum of around $8 million from Russian politicians, raising the question as to just how much money the Tory party has received and whether such transactions should be made more transparent. So you've got corruption within um, Western countries in terms of their um, companies, but again, in terms of the, the way in which these laundered funds come into London and to other Western capitals, there seems to be very little real um, action on the part of politicians to put into place effective, and I emphasise effective, anti-money laundering strategies. Furthermore, corruption in Britain has taken a whole new level, especially when it comes to Brexit, with recent reports leaking information that the British royal family are in fact richer than they may appear with evidence coming through that the land owned by the Windsors in European Union states are receiving millions of euros in EU common agriculture policy grants, which is irony at its finest, as Britain's top family abuse their position, feeding off the EU whilst allowing their country to leave the bloc. Add to this the endless business interests of the royal family, from endorsement of products to real estate to planning of a Netflix TV series, which will no doubt make millions and it seems that as long as corruption is acceptable at the top of the table, then why should it not trickle down to the lower classes? Joining me in the studio today is Nicholas Ryder, a professor in financial crime from the University of the West of England and Bristol since 2013. His expertise is focused on all aspects of financial crime, from money laundering, market manipulation and terrorism financing. Publications by Professor Ryder include the financial crisis and white-collar crime, and fighting financial crime and the global economic crisis. Professor, many thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for inviting me. My first question then relates to the recent FinCEN files that have shown that the UK is being used as a hub for money laundering. How can this have been allowed to happen, and what steps does Britain have in place uh, to prevent all this stuff? Uh, I think one of the most important things to bear in mind is that 
the the publication uh, released over the weekend is just another example of allegations of money laundering, fraud, market manipulation, and links to terrorism, finance, and so. But the global anti-money laundering system is never going to prevent all types of financial crime. So it's just another illustration that the threat hasn't gone away, despite the best efforts of uh, the United Nations Financial Action Task Force. European Union and uh, obviously very important economies like the UK uh, and the US. So I think what the what the files illustrate is that the UK's compliance regime is still not as good as it could be, and which that's a little embarrassing for the UK government, given the very favourable report from the Financial Action Task was the highest ever rating in December 2018. So there are clearly a number of issues that the UK government needs to address in relation to tackling uh, all aspects of financial crime. All right, it appears that the files have also shown that the Russian oligarchs are using money to influence political parties, with one in particular seeing the wife of a Russian billionaire paying for the honor to play tennis with Boris Johnson and attend parties with Theresa May. Should such acts be made more transparent to the public and should they be prevented altogether? I think transparency is very important, and, and I think within the, the domain of alleged donations from individuals from Russia to the, the UK government act as an embarrassment. Um, to me personally, I think transparency is a very important issue. In terms of the legality of such donations, that's obviously a matter for the Electoral Commission. But again, it does leave a rather bad stain on our democracy. And I think it's something that the Electoral Commission needs to look at very carefully indeed. All right, and finally then, it seems that the blame cannot be placed on the UK alone, with the files showing that numerous global entities have been involved. How then are we able to prevent such issues from happening on a global scale? I think on a global scale, it's very important to bear in mind that the sort of the global anti-money laundering regime has, has been in existence for over three to four decades. And it's just another example that the regime is never going to be flawless. It's very important for nation states to work together to exchange important information, um, especially with the increased threat posed by money laundering, as the Finson papers clearly illustrate. So for me personally, it is a matter of um, interaction between nation and states, but also cooperating. Without cooperation, then any effort to tackle money laundering and related financial crime it's hardly going to fail at the first hurdle. Professor Nicholas Ryder there from UWE, many thanks for being here with us today. It's been great hearing your thoughts on this topic. Thank you for your time. All right, we're about to take a quick break here on economic divide, but don't go anywhere because we have plenty more coming right up. We take a look at some of the other economic headlines hitting the front pages around the world in our info news section. We are joined by our regular current affairs and impact analyst, Mohan Abedin, and hear what he has to say about the Finson files as he scans through the online world of social media. We also take a look at some of the other scandals similar to that of Finson and compare them to see just what has been learned from past experiences. And we also take a look at agencies around the world that are trying to combat money laundering and financial crime as we hear from Professor John Hatchard from Buckingham University, a renowned specialist and visiting professor at the UN International Anti-Corruption Academy in Vienna. So sit tight, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this short message. Welcome back to Economic Divide with me, Omid Roshandel. Let's get right back into the action by taking a look at what else is happening in the financial world in our regular info news section. Our first stop is the U.S. An organization called the New Economy Coalition is making some waves. Although not heard of much, its tagline is to fire the bosses, free the land, and elect ourselves. This is a network of 200 plus organizations that says it's building the solidarity economy movement in the United States. Next. South Africa. The economy suffered worst quarterly slide in decades. The GDP fell 16.4% in three months to June after a strict COVID-19 lockdown paralyzed activity. Let's not forget South Africa is Africa's most industrialized nation. 
And finally, Egypt has been suffering from protests due to the state of the economy. Egypt's uprising of the poor is reported to be a real threat to President Sisi. These protests mark a turning point in the country's political scene and may be a step towards retrieving the public sphere from the police state, something Sisi has been faulted for since he came to power. With many other similar scandals hitting the headlines in recent years, let's now take a look at how the FinCEN files compare to other similar leaks, including the famous 2016 Panama Papers, the 2015 Swiss leaks, and the more recent 2017 Paradise Papers. The release of the FinCEN files by the BuzzFeed is nothing new when it comes to exploiting illicit dealings in the financial world. There have been numerous examples of other leaks, including the so-called Panama Papers, which saw over 11 million documents released in 2016, with money laundering and suspicious financial transactions dating back to the 1970s. The papers focused heavily on tax havens, which seemed to suggest that money was being placed in such locations, having already been cleaned by the banks and allowing the holders of the accounts to seal a double victory by avoiding paying taxes on any income generated. Several heads of states and celebrities were named in the papers, which, much like the FinCEN files, saw the likes of the presidents of Argentina and Sudan, as well as the Emir of Qatar, in the mix. So how do the so-called leaks and papers compare, and what can be done to prevent the facilitation of money laundering in the future? The way that I see it is that we need to be looking at the money laundering trail and looking at ways to um, deal with the vulnerabilities in that money laundering trail. And I would um, suggest that over the last few years, there have been a number of very significant initiatives, which um, if we pursue those actively and effectively, can actually deal um, at least partially with these, with, with these problems. With the HSBC Bank heavily involved in the FinCEN files, the bank has come up again in the so-called Swiss leaks of 2015, where the British arm of the bank, along with its Swiss subsidiary, saw that accounts held by over 100,000 clients and 20,000 offshore companies had been operating one of the largest tax evasion schemes in history. Once again, figures in the billions of dollars were involved, with the UK and Switzerland alone seeing $50 billion of money being transferred, and billions more across the globe. It seems that the phenomenon of money laundering and financial crime does not seem to want to be stopped, with banks happy to pay the fines incurred, which are by far lower than the billions, if not trillions, flowing through their accounts to compensate. I'm glad to welcome back into the studio our regular current affairs and impact analyst, Mohan Abedin. Mohan. It's good to see you. Many thanks for being here with us today. I know that uh, you've been keeping a close eye on social media regarding the topic at hand, the FinCEN files. Correct, so yeah. why don't you tell us what you have for us in your first yeah, tweet? Yeah, so if you go to the, uh, the first one, so yeah, obviously it's a feat of journalism. But mind you, it's not unprecedented. Since I think since 2014 we've had these leaks. First it was the Luxembourg leaks, then the Switzerland one, then you had the Panama Papers in 2016, then the Paradise Papers in 2017. So this is a continuation of that really. But the figure, that figure, two trillion, that's massive. I mean, that's, that's impressive. Like, yeah, that's huge. And it speaks to, quite frankly, the corruption of the international financial system. It brings everybody into disrepute not least the US regulatory authorities who always make a fuss when these things come out. But then you have to ask the question, where were they when the activity was unfolding? Yeah. All right, so what about yeah. the next one? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, again, uh, Bank of America people flying to London. Of course, London is the hot spot of uh, money laundering in the world. Uh, and more and more British establishment types are alluding to that. You had Tom Tugendhat, for example, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the UK Parliament, saying, we've got this huge problem. But look, they've had these problems forever. And there's a reason why London is a, is, is a hub for money laundering. It goes beyond finance, about politics. The Brits love this kind of thing. They want the leverage, they want the money, they want the corrupt people because they want to exploit them politically from an intelligence point of view. So this is a huge, huge complex issue. Mm -hmm. And don't let things like, well, I mean, this tweet is innocuous, but when uh, American or British authorities come and say, we're going to clamp on this, it's nonsense. They're not going to do it. So what about Deutsche Bank in particular? Yeah. So 
Yeah, it's look, I mean, it's, it's not just them, um, HSBC, Standard Chartered. They all have issues, you know, right. they all have massive issues. So, so the last one. So yeah, so uh, again, this goes back to the UK being the hub of corruption and, and money laundering. And this is, uh, I mean, if you're, uh, if your viewers who may be familiar with the UK, mm -hmm. this is a regular circus. They come out with these headlines and these things every few months. Will this particular issue make a difference given the, the figures involved? And the politics, we'll just have to wait and see. But this has been unprecedented. Yeah. Well, unprecedented simply because of the figure. It's because two, of the figure, that's what I'm saying. $2 trillion. Yeah. But these leaks, they happen yearly. And quite frankly, you also have to question the motivation behind the leaks. Many thanks to yeah. Mahana Udin there, yeah. our regular current affairs and impact analyst. Let's now take a look at how law enforcement and anti-corruption agencies around the world deal with financial crime and money laundering in our final report of the show. Any law enforcement agency will tell you that they're always one step behind the bad guys. If this were not true, there'd be no crime, as preemptive arrests would stop it from happening. So how then do law enforcement agencies tackle the problem of financial crime? Certainly at local levels, the notion of a regular police officer having any idea of what financial crime looks like is a far-fetched idea. In most developed nations around the world, police are busy dealing with repetitive paperwork and bureaucracy from minor arrests and offences, leaving no time for the bigger fish. Yet with crime so large in scale, as we've seen with the FinCEN files in the trillions of dollars, the act of fighting such a crime can and should only come from an international and government level. Yet, it seems that the highest entities around the world are involved in the crime, hence suggesting it's something that will never be tackled. So what is the solution? There are a number of actions that can be taken against public officials in the victim states. There's got to be transparency, there's got to be uh, effective um, anti-money law uh, anti laws. And civil society organisations and the media, I would suggest, have a, a major role to play in overseeing and ensuring that governments financial institutions, legal professionals are carrying out their anti-money laundering responsibilities um, effectively. Professor John Hatchard has just released his new book, Combating Money Laundering in Africa, which is available through Elgar Publishing. Now, if you're interested in this field of study, our final note goes to Professor Hatchard, who explains just what his new book is all about. What it does is to try to analyse then the strategies for um, combating money laundering and corruption, both in a domestic setting and in a global setting. And to actually recognize that every country is a potential victim or is a potential facilitating state or is a potential safe haven state. There is no doubt that the impact of financial crime and money laundering can have a devastating effect on the global economy. With figures in the trillions of dollars, dirty money eclipses the GDPs of even some of the world's largest economies. One of the most difficult pills to swallow when dealing with money laundering on this scale is the knowledge and involvement of global banks, institutions, and even governments who appear to turn a blind eye to the flow of cash, yet end up charging the customers and citizens of respective countries in fees and taxes when it comes to clearing out the mess. In spite of the best efforts of multiple law enforcement agencies around the world and those in government who are actually fighting to expose and end corruption, the act of financial crime is no different than any other crime. And hence, those attempting to detect, disrupt, and deter the offenses are always one step behind the criminals. Don't forget, this is your show, so get in touch with us via Twitter using the marker ED underscore program and tell us about the stories that matter to you. We're always on hand to share your thoughts, and who knows, we may just feature your story in a future episode. You can watch this episode again or any of our past episodes by simply logging onto our website and clicking on Shows, where you will find all our programs available online 24 hours a day and ready for your viewing pleasure. That's about all the time we have for this week's show. On behalf of myself, Omidro Chandel, and the whole team here on Economic Divide, thanks for watching, stay safe, we'll see you again next time.